This is early breakfast. Weather, yes. What was the weather yesterday? I'm trying to jump. I've lost track of where I was. Now I do seven days a week <laughs> on the radio. I can't remember what happened to the sixth day. I think the Lord made heaven and earth, didn't he? But uh, trying to sort of work out everything. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. I was here yesterday. And then we... Um, we were going to go shopping, but we got a bit bit sidetracked by having breakfast, which was lovely. Don't get me wrong. I went to a, a Paul's. I've never been to a Paul's before. I've seen it. It's one of these chains and uh, had a nice little omelette, which was good. Would have been better with French fries, but, you know, just had the omelette and, and some toast it came with, which was lovely. And uh, was going to go shopping and then suddenly realised, of course... You can't go shopping, can you, on a Sunday? Because uh, if they're over a certain square footage, they can open the shop for browsing, but you can't buy anything. And it's a real pain, because at 11 o'clock in the morning, which is, sun as far as I'm concerned, that's practically bedtime for me, I'm getting ready to sort of sort out the day and what I'm going to be doing. And, um... And and nothing's open. You can go and browse. Oh, spend time browsing. I don't want to browse. I knew what I wanted to go out and buy, but I couldn't go and buy it because the shops were open, but only for looking. Who wants to look? Who wants to... Let's change these archaic laws as soon as possible. Years ago, I, I told you, we had the Keep Sunday special campaign for people who said, listen, we shouldn't be allowed to go shopping on a Sunday because it should be the Lord's Day. And I thought, well, what happens if you're an atheist? You know, why should you have to fall into line with a, with a minority of people? Because they say keep Sunday special. If you want to go to church, go to church. Want to go to mosque, go to mosque. I couldn't care less. I want to go shopping. That's what I want to do. I want to go out there and, and buy things. Not have to stick around till midday. The tills are now open. Well, you can go whistle, because I don't want to go shopping with any place that only opens, you know, from 11 for browsing and then 12. I mean, who wants to wander? It's just impossible. It really is. It's the stupidest law I've ever ever had the misfortune to fall foul of. Because I just want to go and buy something. Oh, we, we can't open the tills. What? So I've got to stand here for 55 minutes holding this pot of coffee, have I? Yep, you certainly have. And you just sort of think, well, it's wrong, isn't it? It is just wrong. So anyway, so it was a nice day. I'm still getting used to driving the car. I haven't, I haven't quite fathomed it all out yet. I'm thinking I'm getting there. <laughs> thinking I'm getting there. But it's, uh, it's a bit big. I don't want to curb the wheels. Because they're, they're part chrome. I'll take a picture of the wheels later and show you. It's part chrome. This week, hugely busy week. Hugely busy week for In Conversation. Hugely busy week. Uh, on Wednesday, I've got the Osmonds back in again. I know that Osmond fans will be outside the front door on Wednesday when the boys arrive. And we always look forward to seeing them. And I've got Bill Bailey as well. And then on Thursday... Uh, have I got Thursday? I'm trying to think if I've got, uh, Thursday. Wait a minute, I'll check. I have to check my little diary on these things. I know that Sean Bean's coming in on Friday. I've never met Sean Bean. Never met him. I'm really looking forward to meeting Sean Bean, so that'll be, that'll be good. And, uh, oh, it's Leslie Brickus. How can I forget Leslie Brickus? 9.30 on, uh, on Thursday. I know what you're waiting, you're all waiting, aren't you? What's Steve's take going to be on the Daily Mail? What's Steve's take? Because everybody else seems to have studiously avoided it. I don't think they did it on the Sky paper review. Nobody was mentioning it earlier on. And I thought, well, it is the front page of a paper. I'm not going to go into the whys and wherefores because it's just another book. And you know that, um, that Lord Ashcroft I'm a big fan of. The reason I'm a big fan of is because at the Imperial War Museum, he has his own room with all the VCs that he's bought. And he's got a room there dedicated to these fantastic medals. And he, he buys them, and they've gone into a special room. I think he paid £5 million to the Imperial War Museum to have a special wing built. I mean, he, he's, a, he's, he's a great advocate of saving history. So for that reason, I like him. What went on in Oxford years ago, I should imagine, takes place in debating centres, the length and breadth of this land, and it was from a different... Who would have known years ago? Who would have known if you'd been at Oxford and you'd been with a young David Cameron, who would have known that he would have been Prime Minister at some point? You don't know these things, do you? It's like, you know, who'd have thought that young Stephen, when he was working in a department store years ago selling carpets, would end up doing, you know, a radio programme and being reasonably successful at it? You don't know what's going to happen in your life. Nobody but nobody can map things out. So there is the story about some of the practices which they get up to at Oxford. They probably do the same at Cambridge, I should imagine. They do the same at most public schools. It goes on. It has gone on for ages. They don't think it's anything odd. Um, the drugs thing, the allegations about drugs and debauchery. I mean, to be honest with you, given the choice, ladies and gentlemen, who wouldn't, who wouldn't welcome a bit of debauchery? I mean, let's face a bit early for me bit early for me at this time of the morning, but I quite like the idea that people, you know, do what they want to do. Never appealed to me. 
because I wasn't very attractive. Sorry, I don't want to go into it and make myself cry. But, I mean, nobody ever went, poor Steve, you know, nobody, nobody ever did that. And I haven't done it recently either, so, uh, so I'm not particularly bothered. And the drugs thing I never got into. I did know people, but, but, but I sort of grew up in an era where people smoked marijuana and things like that. And I, it just never appealed to me. It really didn't. There used to be a woman here at LBC with my same namesake, uh, Carol Allen. We, we weren't related. And she used to smoke herbal cigarettes. And herbal cigarettes smell a little bit like marijuana. And so if she stood in a pub, in the days when you could stand in a pub with a, with a cigarette, she would, people would be going, I think she's smoking a joint. And I said, no, no, it's herbal cigarettes. <laughs> herbal cigarettes. And so I never, I never got into anything like that. It just, it's just because it never appealed to me. I didn't start drinking until I was 18. Caught up a bit since. And so this, this book, which obviously is not great, so at some point the allegation goes that, you know, the Prime Minister, who was then just ordinary Dave Cameron, um, did something with, with a pig's head. People have done funny words to songs, they've done all sorts of great things, and I've thought to myself, listen, if you go back into your own childhood, or the days you were at college, or the days you were at university, there must be things that you think, if ever I become famous and that, and that got out, I'm going to look really silly. Really, really silly. So I don't mind what people got up to when they were, you know, when it was in their in their twenties. All right. So now he's prime minister, and these allegations. The, the book claims that people have seen a photo. So a photo exists, apparently. Well, let's see it. Let's see the photo. Come on. Nobody's a bit shy, are they, in this day and age? Because it's selling a book, and because I'm a fan of Lord Ashcroft, he was a fan. Um, of David Cameron. Now, apparently, he's not a fan of David Cameron. But then people change. But it's, I mean, it's its certainly explosive. But I don't think it's enough for people to shy away from and go, oh, we can't talk about that. You know, you can talk about anything nowadays. I mean, as long as you stay within the right side of the law. But strangely enough, I started getting in on Twitter feeds earlier on. I think Ian Dale started it. He starts everything. He's so desperate to be on my In Conversation programme. And, um... And all of a sudden, Steve, because he said, I can't wait to see what Steve Allen is going to say about it. Well, I didn't up until that moment know that Lord Ashcroft had a book out. So I'm sort of reading all these retweets from people going, oh, Steve Allen will be doing this. I think, what are they talking about? Then I sort of read up on the internet about what had been said. And because um, bearing in mind, Lord Ashcroft funded the Tories for years. He's a billionaire. And so now they've got this this sort of book, which they say is ex is explosive. They say he's a, he's a loyal friend. But don't ever cross him. But I think that's the same of everybody, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you say, what's so-and-so like? You've got to be tough in this business. And I should imagine in politics and in the political world, you've got to be even tougher. I mean, I wouldn't want to cross somebody like Peter Mandelson. You know, you'd be thinking, I bet Peter Mandelson, you know, could have a right cob on, couldn't he? And so it'll be interesting. Now, what, what will happen with this book? I don't know. He's actually said... The reason that I wrote the book is a broken promise. That's why. And so it's, it's Cameron confidential. And there are allegations. Apparently he's been worried this would come out for years. Well, you would, wouldn't you? Although, to be honest with you, I can't remember anything that happened in my 20s. I, I can barely remember the day of the week. I do remember once, and I think I was in my very, very early 20s, and please God, there's not a, there's not a, a picture or anything like that, when streaking was in. There was, a, there was a song in the charts, and it was called The Streak by Ray Stevens. And it was the, the practice that all of a sudden people, seemingly perfectly normal, would take all their clothes off and run down a street. They'd get to the end, then they'd turn around and run back again. And we did it uh, years and years ago. Three of us did it. I used to live in uh, Harleston, Queen's Park. And we took our clothes off and ran down the street. I mean, looking back, it seems really stupid and really daft. But at the time, it was a bit exhilarating. I'm not saying we sort of hung around too long. In the, in the case of the, uh, the drugs, the debauchery and the making of an extraordinary prime minister, so the book claims, uh, my life was quite tame. I didn't go to university. I didn't... I don't think we ever saw a pig's head at all. I do remember distinctly, only in the butcher's shop window. And that, and that was only at Christmas. And the, they used to have the pig's head in the window with, a, with an apple in its mouth, ladies and gentlemen. I never quite understood the significance until much later when I suddenly realised that with pork, you have apple sauce. Well, I've not eaten pork for years. I can't bear pork. Is it funny? I don't do... I can't do lamb anymore, and I can't do pork. But I always remember in the butcher shop window, the pig's head. And, it, I, and I remember thinking, oh, poor thing. What if it's looked round and wonder where the rest of its body's gone to? That's what I worried about. And I should imagine at Oxford they were probably wondering the very same thing. 
it's an allegation. It be easier. Isn't it? Somebody said something, and people have said we, things before about Swiss uh, watch people. Specialist. You know, back it up with a, with, with a photo, back it up with evidence. You know, I'm, I'm expecting a little bit more from somebody, unless they're just, you know, saying, oh, yes, this definitely happened because I've seen a photo of it. Well, you all know about Photoshop and things like that. You know, I'd want to see whether or not it was true. I'm quite... I'm quite of the opinion that there would have been drugs. I would be naive to think, and probably a little bit remiss, not to think that there would be drugs at universities. I mean, that's, you know, people seem... If you watch another country, you get a rough idea what goes on. I didn't think that was, though, that far from the truth. And lots of debauchery, there was lots of free love, and, um, and people were very sexually charged. So I didn't, I didn't actually see it as a bit of a problem. I, I mean, I really don't see it as a bit of a problem. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't quite work out what the act would be, what the uh, what the, the crime would be, if indeed there was a crime, or is this just tittle-tattle that's been passed on down the years? I don't know, actually. So, the decadent Oxford days, well, it's always been decadent. I think our universities have always been a breeding ground for, for decadence and, you know, little hanky-panky kind of thing. I mean, that's what I'm assuming. I don't know. I wasn't there. But, uh, I'm, and I wouldn't remember something like that. I'm, I mean, sometimes somebody will show me a picture taken of me, you know, quite, quite a few years ago, and they go, do you remember that one? I go, do you know, I don't. I do not remember that one. I, I look at them and I think, where did that one come from? In fact, one of, our, one of our, the boys on our news team... Uh, Bill, uh, I said, I've got a photo of an early LBC thing. So I don't know who everybody is on it. I said, well, I can't remember any of the LBC pictures. Sometimes they, they, they get thrown up. Somebody, uh, an LBC uh, aficionado, will say, oh, I've got a picture of you doing a charity event 30 years ago. I said, well, I must have been very young, and obviously in my pram, to, uh, to realise that this, this was going on. Because I can't remember that. I mean, whether you'd remember that, I don't know. If it all went by in a haze of sort of puffy, puffy smoke, I don't know. But it's, it's an interest. The book will probably sell. I think the book will, will, will definitely sell because people are interested, aren't they? Pe people like reading about that kind of thing. I like, I'm, a, I'm the same as everybody else. I like reading about these kind of things. I, I, I don't necessarily believe everything. I really don't. Talking of not believing anything, in the, uh, in the papers today, they're, they're, they were talking about the, uh, the false memories behind the VIP abuse claims. And it turned out that uh, one of the, uh, the guys, who is known only as Darren... Uh, this is well, a key witness to allegations against, uh, the, you know, the, the police investigation into the VIP, uh, including a former Prime Minister, sundry other peers and MPs, who were uh, abusing a number of boys. They were sexually tortured and murdered. Well, I didn't believe a word of it. I seriously didn't believe a word of it. I don't believe in this stuff. I mean, what, where are we living? Where are we living? You know, I know we had the uh, permissive 60s and 50s, and you could probably get away with an awful lot more then. I do not believe that there was a VIP ring which was passing. It would be too dangerous. Far too dangerous. You know, and senior members of the security services were involved in the murder and torture of, uh, of young boys. I don't believe it. Uh, but although, having said that, I'm probably of the opinion that perhaps I don't want to believe it because it's so far-fetched, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly entertain it. I mean, one of the key witnesses to three... Three of these proposed crimes, whose name is only known as Darren, it's not his real name, that's the name that they've used, was uh, revealed yesterday as a man with a history of false claims. Seriously. I mean, this man here had been sentenced for two years' imprisonment for making hoax bomb calls, nuisance and threatening calls about neighbours and criminal damage. He also falsely confessed to the murder of a prostitute during a high-profile police manhunt in the 90s. I mean, he's quite clearly got some mental illness. You know, you have to be very careful on these things. You know, we do know that there are, you know, people out there who sort of go and confess to crimes that they've got nothing to do with. And the police have to investigate, wasting everybody's time and money, knowing at the end of the day, there's going to be no evidence. There is nothing. And on this VIP thing, there is no evidence. There is nothing at all. I mean, I do not believe that boys were murdered. What you mean? So, so somebody... On one of them, wasn't it the most ridiculous allegation? They were stabbed 40 times. And, and you think... So, you know, just by the sheer logic of this, so nobody heard anything in all the other flats in, in Dolphin Square, which are, which are old flats. They're thin walls. You can hear things through walls. You're telling me that nobody heard anything because there was a secret VIP ring there. What, nobody noticed? Nobody noticed these things. I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. Uh, Let's say one of my family's just died of cancer after discovering it four weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest with you... Uh, 
she knew she had cancer. This is this is Jackie Collins. And I think this was six years ago. Six years ago, she was diagnosed. I think then it had... Because the last time I saw her, she looked absolutely fine. She was on top of the world. She was all, She's always been very chatty. She's always been very, very good value for money, as we say in the business. And uh, I always loved her to bits. And so, so she came in. Two weeks ago, uh, Jackie knew it had come back and she told Joan... So they've had two weeks, and that's why I think they, they cut the tour short. I think all of a sudden she started getting tired, and uh, my interview got cancelled, and a number of other interviews got cancelled, because I wasn't just doing a quick five-minute soundbite. I'm, I'm sort of 30 minutes, but you've got to get into the building, you've got to get out of the building, you've got to do everything. So uh, that's why, and little did we realise that uh, it had come back. So uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting, because she's got loads of... Loads of people saying really nice things about her because she was nice. But she did know where all the bodies were buried in Hollywood. She knew, knew of the scandals, like loads of us do. There's a very good book, and I think it's called The Casting Couch. And it talks about all the actors and actresses who went through the casting couch. To make themselves famous, they slept with agents, and agents seduced them. I mean, we all know about, uh, about lots of famous people. The only one apparently who didn't was Betty Davis. Betty Davis was the only one who never did the casting couch. And the reason being, she wasn't ever considered attractive enough. So uh, so nobody bothered. Rock Hudson, though, uh, he'd been through the casting couch. Various uh, male agents had taken advantage of a young Rock Hudson. In fact, it was the same agent who took advantage of, and gave them all new names, like Tyrone and Rock, you know, to make them sound very big and butch. Uh, the casting couch is by somebody called... It's a book. And it's by Selwyn... Something, Selwyn, something, Selwyn. Because I remember I bought a copy of short one ago. I remember reading it as a as a, as a younger person and thinking um, this is quite interesting. And it did talk about you know. I, and I believe actually at one of the big studios years and years ago. That's it. The casting couch. Selwyn Ford, the author, and uh, one of the studios at three o'clock in the afternoon they would have what they they called um, the casting couch. And the uh, and the hierarchy in the studio. That's when you would road test all the young starlets, you know, because that's that's how the business worked. It's it's very much sex is uh, is the kind of thing. Not just in Oxford, then. Not just in Oxford. It's taking place all over the place. They're all at it. I'm the only one who's not at it. I wish I was. I sometimes feel a bit left out of these things. They go, oh, it was all debauchery. I go, was it? Um, they get anything like that. Nothing. I was, nobody ever considered I was interesting enough. Of course, now I'm way too old for it. Now people are taking an interest. Somebody offered me their seat on a bus the other day. Seriously, me. Sprite little thing like me, and somebody offered me their seat. I wasn't actually sure whether to be flattered or insulted. I decided I was flattered at the time, but when I got off the bus, I was in a foul mood. Had he offered me... I mean, I said I, de I declined. I said, no, no, I'm fine. I always make an excuse, because I, I like standing. Uh, and they always go, oh, would you like to sit? I go, no, I've got a bad back. I don't know why you have to tell people about your medical conditions, but I, I just feel that I should tell people about these sort of things. <laughs> Would you like my seat? No, I'm fine, thank you. I'm just standing up because I've got a very, very bad back. Uh, Jerry says, uh, uh, did you mean to say in your prime, not in your pram? No, I meant to say in my pram. I know what I'm saying on this. I love the way people sort of say... I said the other day that there was... Uh, what was it? Oh, there was something that, that came up somewhere and somebody said, oh, that's right, Piff the Magic Dragon who is John Vanderput, who's been on my Christmas show at the Magic Circle. And, and somebody wrote to me, wait, I think you mean Puff the Magic Dragon. I went, no, I mean Piff the Magic Dragon. If I'd meant Puff the Magic Dragon by Peter, Paul and Mary, I'd have said blooming Puff the Magic Dragon. Honestly, I tell you, this time of the morning, you do get a lot of people on medicine. I appreciate the fact that sometimes the medicine is kind of wearing off a little bit. Uh, there was another story in the paper today. What, what did I, oh, oh, that's right. Ah, ah. It was one of my, my, my favourite old fatties. Yes, good old Gemma Collins rears her ugly head. Her five seconds of fame is dwindling and going really, really fast. I think it was in The Sun, was it? It was certainly in one of the, uh, the papers. It, it was obviously somebody who was... She's obviously fed something out to try and get some sort of interest going in her career, which has, which has ground to a halt. I mentioned her diet she'd been on the other day which resulted in her losing three stone in a month. And I'm telling you now, it's dangerous. I couldn't care less what anybody says to you. Ask any doctor, ask any medically qualified person, and they will tell you two pounds a week is what you're supposed to lose. That would be eight pounds. To lose three stone in a month, she's going to pile it on big time. Because if you sit down, if they lock you in a room and they feed you just juice all the time, quite clearly, you're going to spend A, most of your time in the loo, 
B, it's going to screw up your insides because you're not taking in any sort of solids. You've got to take in solids. So you watch. You mark my words. Gemma Collins will pile it back on again. Pile it back on again. You know, don't ever go down. Don't ever go... Don't ever... What are you saying? I can't believe... You know, don't... Where's these words coming from? It's like I'm possessed by an inner spirit. The spirit of Oxford. The spirit of, my God, it's that pig's head back again. You know, the kind of thing that you worry about. But, I mean, it's, you should really not go down that route. If you, want to, if you want to lose weight, the Steve Allen Guide is the same as any nutritionist will tell you. You go to your doctor and they will give you a diet sheet. They will tell you little and often. You don't have to give up all the nice things that you like. I mean, if you stuff your face with fried foods and chips and you know, cakes and everything and pile sugar into your drinks, well, obviously, you're going to put on weight. So, little and often, do not go down the route of Gemma Collins. She's just a fatty. She's always been a fatty. She will always be a fatty. Unlike the other end of the spectrum, when you get poor old spag bowl, I mean, she's getting more emaciated. I mean, she is looking more like a negative. Seriously, I mean, you've only got to look at her on the television. I mean, eat something. I'll tell you the story a bit later about the, uh, about the ice cream. Apparently, she needed for a blue fit. So the story goes, so it can't be true, can it? Um, Tarby was on Loose Women yesterday, and uh, they asked him the question. Ruth asked the question about, you know, the, uh, the claims against him, uh, which, you know, there are no claims against him now because it's been proven that the person who made the allegations just didn't know what the hell she was on about. She claimed that she'd met him, I think the story goes, at the BBC in a dressing room at Top of the Pops. He said, why would I have been at Top of the Pops? I had nothing to do with Top of the Pops. I'm a comedian. And, uh, and, then, and then she said, of course, it happened at Lime Grove. And he said, well, it didn't, because in those years, uh, Top of the Pops came from Manchester. So they couldn't get anything right at all. I suppose you could argue the fact that it was a case of perhaps people forget uh, where something took place. But you'd remember something like that. And uh, anyway, he had uh, 14 police officers turned up at his house and uh, asked him for his computer. And he said, I don't have a computer. And they said, of course you've got a computer. He said, I don't have a computer. And they took away all his videos. He said they were golfing videos and me at the London Palladium. I don't know what on earth they were expecting to find. I mean, 14 police officers. I mean, you have to ask the question, don't you? You know, 14 police officers. Perhaps it's something to do with our area. I think he lives around Kingston, uh, which is down the road from me. 14 police officers. When Benny Hill died, 12 turned up. 12 police officers. Benny Hill, to peer at him because he died on his uh, couch in front of the television over the weekend. 12, but what in God's name are they doing there? 12 and 14 for Jimmy Tarbert. They probably couldn't believe the luck, could they, really? Uh, Strictly, I'm a buffoon, says Jeremy. He thinks he's going to be the buffoon of it, so I've got my money on Peter Andre. And Rachel Stevens, this is day three now of a story that we started three days ago. And the story was that she, uh, she d- dumps the kids in the car, leaves them there, locks it and goes off shopping for ten minutes. All right, only ten minutes. Only ten minutes. You know, and it's up to her. There is no law, apparently, about leaving your children home alone in the car, which is probably roughly the same as why the McCanns were never prosecuted for leaving the kids alone. There is no law that says you can be prosecuted. There's nothing on the statute books at all. So Rachel Stevens is fairly okay leaving the kids in the car, and uh, they were happily playing. But, I mean, it it could have been different, couldn't it? I I do keep... So I'm trying to remind myself that it could actually be different. Uh, Corrie's live show left in chaos. I believe it's tomorrow. Rita's gone sick. Genuinely sick. And um, she's, she's getting on a little bit now. Getting on a wee bit. Uh, the booziest Bond is Daniel Craig. Apparently, in a film, he consumes about 20 units of booze. See, I don't know what that's the equivalent to. I've got no idea. They were boozing around here yesterday. God, there was champagne flowing and all sorts of nice things. I, of course, was nothing to do with it. Nobody brought me champagne. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not proud. I'm not proud. And then um, I was talking earlier on about the, uh, the pizza story from America where the bloke who gets the Domino's pizza and inside there's $1,300 and they give him free pizza. The producer said, he said, that had been me. He said, free pizza for the year. He said, I'd have milked that one. He said I'd have gone, you know, the Viennetta, the, the garlic bread, the Coca-Cola, the Pepsi, whatever it is that comes with it. He said I'd have gone mad for stuff like that. And then we have this dilemma, don't we? Would you have given the money back? Would you have given the money back? I was very honest years ago. I told the producer that, um, that when I was at school, so it must be quite a few years ago, on the oxen cart, and, um, and, and I was standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus in my little Packamac. And, uh, and and there was a wallet on the ground, actually in the bus shelter, actually in the bus shelter. And so I picked it up, being naturally curious, and there was one pound ten shillings in it. Thirty bob in those days, one pound ten shillings. Nowadays, you know, nothing. I've got more than that in change in my pocket at the moment. And um, 
and I took it to the police station. Because I was brought up like that. I know, you know, you sort of go, oh, no, you shouldn't, you know, well, why didn't you just keep it? And you go, well, somebody might have needed it. And they might have gone, listen, I lost my, my wallet or my purse, whatever it was, at the bus stop and had pound ten in and I needed that money. So I handed it in and I think uh, it got to stay there for a month. And then after the month, the police uh, called my home and said uh, nobody's claimed it. So I went back and they gave me the pound ten shillings. <laughs> that nice? Can't remember what I bought with it. House, probably, or something like that, or a car, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, it is true. That, but then, if you found a lot of money, if you found a lot of money... A friend of mine lost a lot of money a while ago. He was going to market to buy something. And he had 1,500 quid in a brown paper bag, folded up and in his pocket. And I think it fell out. Whatever it was, when he got to market, he didn't have it. And he went and retraced his steps. As if somebody's going to pick up a brown paper bag in a car park, open it up and go, blimey me and walk away with it. That's what somebody's going to do, isn't it? They're not going to hand it in. People aren't honest nowadays. People are going to keep it. It's £1,500. They'd probably immediately put it in their pocket, thinking, I'll go and count this somewhere else. You look around, see any CCTV cameras? No, no CCTV cameras. So uh, the good news is you get to keep it. But I was always brought up, you know, be honest, and it'll pay, pay dividends in the long run. I got my 30 bob. I'm not saying I would do the same if I found thousands of pounds, because I don't know what I'd do until I was actually in the situation. I, re- I mean, I seriously don't know what I'd do. I would like to think that I would be honest. I would like to think that I would be the sort of person, because somebody else might really need that money. It might be to pay a gambling debt. It might be to pay a mortgage. It might be for shopping. It could be for all sorts of things. It could be for a care home, rent and rates and stuff like that, bills, anything. So I would always give it back. Always give it back. Although, I suppose the argument would be, if you're in a supermarket and they, uh, and they scan all your items, but they, in fact, leave off two expensive items and they don't do them, would you, would you pull them up on it and go, I don't think you did this? I have done that in a supermarket before. God, I'm goody two-shoes here. I don't like to sound goody two-shoes. But it, it, it is a, a similar situation. I remember saying to her once, I said, I think you've actually forgotten to do that. She went, oh, thank you. And I'm, I would always like to think I would do it. Although, if I found a, a huge mail sack... Imagine if somebody had left a huge mail sack, you know, in our car park here or at home or wherever it happens to be, and, and you opened it up and there was the contents of a bank for the day. I, mean, I don't know I don't really... I'd probably want to take it home and count it just to see what it looked like. Because <laughs> I'm never likely to have that again. You know, just imagine if you counted it out, there was like £600,000 in there and it had fallen off, a, fallen off one of these money places. And you think to yourself... Do you keep it or do you give it back? Are the notes marked? I don't know. Far too dangerous to keep it, I think. Far too dangerous. So, on the on the subject of uh, poor old Mr Cameron, and I say poor old Mr Cameron because the one person you don't want to fall foul of is apparently Lord Ashcroft, who, as you know from this programme, I'm a big fan of because I'm a big fan of the, of the philanthropic work that he does uh, in saving things for the nation. So I'm a big fan of that. He quite, qu- quite clearly feels a bit miffed he quite clearly feels a bit miffed that he didn't get sort of a bigger job uh, or something like that. But, I mean, he's still Lord Ashcroft and he still appears to be a great benefactor, but, but you don't want to fall foul of him, which I can imagine must be quite difficult if you're the Prime Minister. Nobody was to know that uh, that Dave's chipping Snorton set, as they're now laughingly calling it, uh, Snorton because it, it comes in with sort of cocaine and stuff like that. There are all sorts of allegations, not to do with him, but to do with the people that he was hanging around with. Uh, the PM's brother holidayed with Rebecca Brooks, his fury over the AIDS affair with Sam's stepdad, the first picture of him riding to hounds. And what they're basically saying is, you know, is this man right to, to run the country? Does he understand anything about working-class people? Does he understand anything at all? And the answer is... But, you know, people want to aspire to that. Working-class people want to aspire to something better, don't they? I mean, mean, I'm a working-class person, you know, and if if I didn't want to aspire to anything, I'd I'd have sort of left myself where I was. But I, I sort of wanted to make a bit more of myself so that your parents are proud of you. That's what you do. There's nothing the matter with that. Margaret Thatcher was working class. What was her, what was her father? Greengrocer. Couldn't have been more working class if she tried. But then, and, but yet she sounded terribly, terribly bosh. But I've got a tape somewhere at home of her learning how to speak properly, how to make sure that people hung on her every word. And so I don't see what, what he's done as being particularly wrong. They're, bearing in mind, they are just flogging a book. That's all it is. And the, the more coverage you can get out of it, the, uh, the more the book will probably sell. Who buys it, I think, is the big question. I don't know who would buy it. 
Uh, Darren's going to buy a copy, I know, because he likes these political sort of things. But then, you know, you have to... One of the columnists, I think Toby Young, has said he doesn't believe a word of it. He said, I've been at these, these uh, places. He said, I just don't believe that this happened. So, you know, you pays your money, you takes your choice. It sells a book, though, doesn't it? Obviously, he was feeling a little bit aggrieved, and he wrote the book, and that's, you know, he said, I was a fan of Cameron, now I'm not a fan of Cameron. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Everybody can write a book about people you don't, don't like. I mean, I could write a book about Joey Essex, or Keith Lemon, or Gemma Collins, or just about anybody else on that programme. What did I see the other day? I thought I was having a bit of deja vu. I was sitting in front of the television, and it was like an 8 out of 10 Cats programme, but with people from uh, Big Brother, including Jade Goody. There was Jade Goody doing her playing dumb, thick, whatever it was kind of routine. And I didn't believe it then. I certainly wouldn't believe it when I first saw it. You know, East Anglia. Was it East Anglia or something like that? I mean, she didn't know anything at all. But then she played up to it. Joey Essex tried that one. And, of course, what's he ended up doing? Advertising bingo. How sad, honestly. How to wash up a career. Do you think he'll still be around in a year's time? Shouldn't think so. Gemma Collins? Well, she hasn't got anything at all now. She's got the, the the fat clothes range, which, of course, is a bit of a misnomer, seeing as she's not fat anymore. Well, she says she's lost three stone. I suspect it's a little bit of PR puff. And in her case, quite a lot of puff. <laughs> and then just let... Like, like a giant balloon. And then just let the air out. So they, they've got a story about Victoria Beckham in the papers today. Uh, Vicky going out looking as miserable as sin. Now, they're playing it two ways. One way they're saying she's told Dave, come back home, because there's rumours about the uh, the marriage, you know. I mean, some of the papers have gone so overboard with it and gone, oh, the cracks are appearing in this. They've been like this for donkey's years. Seriously, they've been like this for such a long time. They don't need to sort of worry about... You know, is the marriage rock solid? And then just had Harper, for goodness sake, not that many years ago. But uh, anyway, she went to the Cotswolds and she popped into a corner shop to go and actually get an ice lolly. Uh, he was sitting outside in the car. You'd think, actually, the kids could have gone and got it because you know what she's like, a little bit publicity hungry, but anything to get a picture in the paper. And so somebody somewhere went, can we have a copy of that picture? OK, send that into the papers today. Victoria being all normal. Uh, David Beckham sporting a flat cap because he doesn't want to do his hair every single day. And uh, Mrs Beckham uh, posed with the girls. There's three, three girls who they bumped into there called uh, Erin, Uma and Maisie, all aged 11. Uh, she kept her dark glasses on because uh, that's Victoria Beckham's look, isn't it? And her husband told locals they were in the area to visit friends. Lord, I didn't think the Beckhams had any friends. <laughs> I thought it was all movie stars or stuff like that. Perhaps they've got normal people. Perhaps they like normal people as friends. Difficult, though, isn't it, to sort of when you, when you say, how many friends have you got as opposed to how many acquaintances have you got? You know, in terms of friends, I've had the same group of friends for ages and ages. I've got lots of acquaintances, lots of acquaintances. Uh, but uh, true friends, you know, people that would drop everything for you. Nobody. Uh, there's another story in the paper today. Remember I did the one yesterday about the care home bully? This is the family of a dementia sufferer abused by a carer have demanded that police reopen the case after he was let off with a caution. This is the story of Bridget MacDonald. Her family used a hidden camera to, uh, to catch the carer, Adam Hunt, yanking sheets off her bed, swearing at her. A really disgusting piece of work. This bloke never appeared before a court. He's got a fag in his mouth. He's allowed to abuse an elderly dementia uh, patient... Uh, I mean, last night, the uh, MP for Birmingham, Khalid Mahmood, said there needs to be a fitting punishment to act as a deterrent to stop people doing this. I mean, I absolutely think it's scandalous that families have got to resort to using hidden cameras to find somebody who's abusing. I'd go round there and I would be so cross, ladies and gentlemen. I'd be making sure that every time he walked outside his house, we'd be throwing beetroot, rotten eggs... Oh, peppermint, everything, you name it, I'd be throwing it. I mean, it's all for... This woman's 68... This woman became very anxious. That's why they put the camera in there, to discover this, this bloke, um, you know, who promised to write a letter of apology. He's done no such thing at all. And this, this man should be in prison. He's abusing... I mean, to be honest with you, getting off with a caution, you get more for shoplifting nowadays, don't you? More, more for shoplifting, and yet for sort of abusing an elderly woman. You know, you want to go round there. This is Adam Hunt's uh, place. And seriously, you know, remind him of what his place in society is and what it's going to be. And I do feel sorry. I do feel sorry for a soldier who was left brain damaged in Afghanistan. He's now stuck in this legal battle with his ex-wife, who's trying to claim his last 200,000 quid. I can see why, actually. She was When they, when they were married, um, you know, it was all going fine. He was paid a million pounds... 
uh, by the Ministry of Defence, he was left with life-changing injuries when his vehicle was hit by a Taliban bomb. After spending thousands paying for the house to be adapted to fit his needs, Mr Vaughan, who's only able to speak with the help of a computer and is confined to a wheelchair, has £200,000 out of his payout remaining. His wife, Donna Vaughan... Uh, who left him on Valentine's Day two years ago, is trying to claim 185,000 quid of the money, as well as monthly child maintenance fees of 1,500. He's in a wheelchair, love. He's at, where do you think he's going to get it from? It's going to float out the sky. So she wants the last 200,000. Whilst I understand how divorces work, I can't help feeling that she's obviously got no feelings for him whatsoever. It's a shame, really. Uh, yesterday, Richard Sear, representing Mr Vaughan, said that uh, Mrs Vaughan was asking for £100,000 to pay off the mortgage on one of the couple's two properties, as well as eighty five grand for legal bills. In effect, in effect that's the, the whole 200000 quid that he's got left. Doesn't seem right, does it? But, uh, but she said, you know, people are forgetting about our little boy and stuff like that, and I suppose people have to move on. I suppose you have to put to one side the fact he's in a wheelchair and he can't do anything himself for himself. That's why it's sad, isn't it, really, that that's all he's got. He was given 1.1 million. God knows where the rest of it went. Oh, they built a house. That's right, they built a house, and so she wants the money. I suppose if the worst comes to the worst, he can downsize, but it, the house has got to be adapted for him. Otherwise, it's just not going to work, is it? I don't know. Why can't we find happy stories? There aren't any happy stories. I wish there were happy stories. Unless you're a fan of David Cameron, in which case you're probably laughing like a drain. Oh, Carol Vorderman's found love again. I was a bit pleased about that. I like the idea. And she's, she's, she's back with the, uh, the bloke from the REF, the, uh, the, uh, the plane-flying bloke, the pilot. That's right. I knew there was a name for these people. Um, and probably the best TV ads in the world. 60 years of favourite TV ads. So, for example, uh, finger-licking good. Make out your own ones on that, I suppose. Uh, good to the last drop. Do you know what good to the last drop would be advertising? Good to the last drop is... Maxwell House. Do you know, I wouldn't have known that was... I thought it'd be a wine. Good to the last drop, Maxwell House. OK, the best a man can get. You know what that one is? That's Gillette. The best a man can get. You didn't know that one? OK, I'm going to try you next door. OK, have you done these before? Did Darren do them on the show? OK, right. OK, here, here we go. Um, uh, um, only the crumbliest, flakiest chocolate... What's that one? It is Cadbury's float. Well done. OK. Been using that one since 1959. Um, connecting people. Connecting people. No, Nokia, not Skype. Nokia. Um, good things come to those who wait. It's, oh, you knew Guinness. Oh, well done, well done. Because he knows the boozy ones, doesn't he? The Appliance of Science. That's quite well known, isn't it? Not Hot Point, no. It's one of those kind of... It is Zanussi, yeah, it's Zanussi. Uh, are you playing along at home? <laughs> don't take your hands off the wheel. Uh, if you're driving, you know, I don't want people to sort of start waving their hands. Say it with flowers. That's dead easy, isn't it? That's into flora. It, it couldn't be anybody else, actually. I don't know anybody else. Um, because I'm worth it. L'Oreal, yeah. <laughs> Old Spagbol doing that one. Very funny indeed. Uh, your flexible friend. Not a... No, it's not Barclay Card or Visa, but it's the other one. No, we don't have it anymore. Access. Access, your flexible friend. No, it, it was obviously... It was <laughs> 1978, that was. We've given up doing dates on this programme, because... You were what? Minus six. Minus six. You weren't bored. Oh, really? Oh, God, how embarrassing. How embarrassing. OK, right, I'll give you, I'll give you two more. Taste the rainbow... Skittles. All right, oh, well done. I like, is that the advert where they touch it and everything goes to Skittles? Wish they'd build this studio like that. One slice is never enough. Uh, no. No. We were talking about it earlier on when you said that if you had a pizza, you'd go mad for pizza every single day. One slice is never enough. No, Vianetta. Vianetta. <laughs> we were talking about Vianetta and... Um, <laughs> reassuringly expensive. Reassuringly expensive. You sh You definitely know this one. You would probably drink this. Stella. Stella Artois. Not no, not have a choice. Oh, he doesn't like it. <laughs> Just do it. Oh, right. Oh, they know that. See, they're funny. They know Nike. That was since 1988, that one. Um, 
Oh, you'll know this one. Tastes so good, cats ask for it by name. You know, you're ne- it's not going to be whiskers, no. You're never gonna, you won't get this one at all. It's called Meow Mix. Did you see there was a woman on the television the other day? I watched a documentary, and it was about a woman in America, and she's got cats. Now, Will, the producer, has a cat, isn't it? Have you got what? You've got two cats. How many do you think this woman's got? She's got a thousand. She's got a thousand. She started off um, with a couple of cats. Uh, then she got divorced. She's a former beauty queen, so she's not she's not cracked at all. She seems perfectly normal. She now, after all these years, she filled in her swimming pool, because that was a bit pointless. She has a team of 40 people who go in. They start feeding at four in the morning. Uh, the cats have got... There's a special area if the cat has got AIDS, uh, so they're separated, but enough stuff in there to keep them occupied. She's potty about cats. I mean, completely crackers. And I watched this thing and, and I was, I was, she also offers people a chance to go and stay there. You can book in for a holiday with all these cats. So my, my friend Helena said, I'm going to go over there. I said, why? She said, because I, she loves cats. She said, and I want to see what a thousand cats looks like. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. They've all got, you know, games to play. They feed them. They look after them. They get their vet's bills done. So 40 people. It's now a multi- dollar business. They get through, is it how many hundred weight of cat litter every week? <laughs> because they've got to do all the cat litter trays, they've got to clean everything. It's a labour of love, but she's got so many cats, I thought, I thought they'd be so, Ew. I mean, she has been scratched quite clearly, because cats do occasionally do that when you really annoy them. But uh, just to see all these cats, but most of them seem to be asleep. Or drugged. And, um, and the <laughs> there's people coming around to film. Put, put a little, little, little bit of extra something in the food this morning. And so these cats are asleep. They all look really happy. They all look really happy. She's got, I think, something like 300 kittens. I mean, the first thing I thought of was, say she drops dead at the end of this filming, who's going to look after a thousand cats? They did a thing, I felt a bit changing the subject, but still with animals. They did a programme on uh, the Australian vet where they go around there and go, oh, cribes, mate, you've got uh, too many chickens in this barn. And, uh, and I go, they're so funny, aren't they, Australians? They always make us laugh, they're funny little accents. <laughs> oh, cribes, mate. And, uh, and they went around to one place, and he, he was keeping chickens. And she said, oh, you shouldn't really be keeping this, this many chooks uh, in the barn. They should be allowed outside. And they're all fairly butch, the women who work for the, uh, the sort of veterinary services over in Australia. And so they were, he said, oh, well, well I've, I've opened the door, and they don't want to go out... And so she said, well, I think you should let them out. And it becomes like a comedy show. And so, but then they had somebody who'd not done something right with puppies. And they ended up with 12 puppies. And they said, we're going to have to put them all down. I think something had happened. They weren't trainable. Or there was something, there was something, whatever it was, it didn't quite seem believable to me. I was a bit, bit disturbed that they would actually be putting puppies down. But they had 12 of these adorable little things. And they said, oh, well, we're going to have to euthanise them. I thought, I wish somebody had euthanised you. <laughs> make, it, make it easier for everybody else. There was some reason why, why they had to put them down. Whatever it was, it wasn't, uh, wasn't the best thing I'd ever heard. Dave Beckham gives another one of his boringly tedious interviews. Why won't they do them live? Producer pointed out to me, he said they'll never do that. Would you let, if you were Dave's uh, agent, would you ever let him do a live interview? He might sit there and go, and sort of do something really peculiar. So they have to pre-record it so they can sort of edit it and make sure that it all looks great. Um, <coughs> Anthony uh, Banahan on The X Factor uh, exposed today as a thug who robbed a woman. And there was another woman on The X Factor and they've dropped her because she's got a criminal record. Excuse me, there's somebody on the panel who's been to court. She's got a record as well. Why is she still on the panel? Obviously, two different rules running on the X Factor, and they wonder why it's hemorrhaging audience. Uh, Flora Shedden is struggling with her fame. Uh, she has to be smuggled out of pubs with a coat on her head. I didn't know who she was. They said, oh, she's on the, the Great British Bake Off. I went, what, she's struggling with her fame? What fame? Well, she's baked a cake on television, and she has to be smuggled out of pubs. What a load of old garbage, honestly. The rubbish they come up with now. The rubbish they come up with. Cara Delevingne leaving a fashion party again. Obviously doesn't handle drink very well. Doesn't really handle anything very well, does she, really? She can't keep girlfriends for love nor money. And then she was supported by Eugenie. You know Eugenie? She's another one out of uh, Prince Andrew's brood who doesn't seem to do anything for a living apart from sort of troll around parties. A bit like Prince Andrew and old Fergie, isn't it, really? I suppose a whole family of bone idle people. Honestly, can't bear them. Can't bear them. But uh, the rest of the family I quite like. Uh, the RSPCA could lose its power to take people to court for animal cruelty. 
which is interesting, because they do do that, don't they? Do you know they prosecuted a woman years ago for the goldfish? She went on holiday and left a goldfish in a bowl, and the neighbour reported it, and so they, they took her to court. Uh, I've had run-ins with, uh, with the RSPCA. They'll only turn up if there's a camera crew there. They're sort of they're a little bit sort of a little bit snooty about certain things, but they have their their television programs and they they seem to be good. But it is a, it's a money making business. It's not you know it's a charity, but it's a money making business, and that's how they survive. So uh, so there's the RSPCA in the papers. What else was there yesterday? There was something else yesterday. I can remember thinking to myself, you know, um, why do we do? Th- it was a program I was watching on the television, and for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. It might, oh, I was a bit shocked by uh, Alex Sibley ex of Big Brother, who took all his clothes off for the sun yesterday. There were quite a number of men. They, they were looking at men's, uh, men's beer bellies. And I think that's what they were looking at anyway. And so, uh, Alex, uh, I don't, to be honest with you, I was amazed you could actually hide it in, uh, in one hand. But anyway. And so they, they sort of had Alex Sibley there with a load of other people. I think he was the only famous one. And they persuade them all to stand there and take their clothes off. <laughs> I'm still trying to get them around to, to doing it here. I think we could get all the presenter in this building, all the presenters, and we could all sort of stand there and hide behind each other and, uh, and do sort of a Christmas calendar. Everybody else has done one. I see no real... Listen, if you're going to buy the Ollie Murs calendar, I don't see why you wouldn't buy sort of a, a Steve Allen calendar. I think, you know, we, I could have strategically placed berries at Christmas and stuff like that, or we could all hide behind Nick Ferrari. I quite see, you know, each presenter could have a different sort of, you know, month of the year. I'd have to be Christmas, because I love Christmas. And I could be there with sort of a Father Christmas hat on, and Nick Ferrari could be in front of me, sort of... I've just thought, just sort of a dreadful picture scenario. And as I was saying it, I was thinking he could be Rudolph. And then I thought, no, that means I'd be behind him on the sleigh. And I didn't think that kind of made a very good photograph. <laughs> to, to the untrained eye, that might look somewhat suspect. And I don't, I mean, Nick will go along with most things that I come up with. I don't think he's going to go for that one. Kneeling down in front of Steve Allen is not going to be top of his agenda. Anyway, uh, so Lily Allen, <laughs> but I'm now trying to take this image out of my mind, because I'm trying to think which other presenters we, we, we could use. Who would we have for January. January could be, I don't know, it's got to be sort of somebody, James O'Brien, I think, could be sort of January. Or could he be April? It it could either be January or April. I don't know, actually. He has to feature in there somewhere, and uh, we've definitely got to get Tom Swarbrick's clothes off. Definitely. we we get. It's going to be a nude calendar, by the way. Did I I explain this? It's going to be a nude calendar. I thought it would sell really well for charity. (laughs) Unfortunately, I am the only one who thinks it's going to sell really well for charity. Uh, Lily Allen goes out to some uh, do the other day, and as I say, because she's obviously suffering from a dearth of publicity, I'm getting a bit bored, actually, with Lillian. I quite like her. I'm just a bit bored with these stupid stories. And this time, apparently, she was out somewhere, and uh, the the act didn't acknowledge her, and so she left in tears. And then they told me who the act was, and I have to be honest, I didn't know who the act was at all. I'm obviously not uh, not up to date with, with some of the, the modern music people. Uh, so it's not here, is it? That's not that one. That's a bit about Strictly. A little bit about uh, the Corrie uh, live uh, live show, which I think is tonight, which, to be honest with you, I couldn't care less. Oh, well, there was a bit about poor old Harry Styles, or Harry No Style, I think, wearing a, a little uh, Gucci outfit. I mean, I suppose this is what sort of redundant pop stars wear now, which costs 3,000 quid. Who's going to wear that? Who is going to work seriously? It was the most awful thing I'd ever seen. Uh, the Beckham interview with Susanna Reid, where she flirted, but that's how you get a good interview out of people. You flirt. You do. A, you want a good interview out of somebody, you sort of sit there. But I don't think you can ever risk poor old Davy Boy Beckham uh, live. I think they have to do him pre-recorded in case they go, actually, no, no, Dave, you can't really say that. And they're going to be deciding whether or not bridge is a sport or a game. They actually want it defined as a sport or a game. And I thought you are having some sort of laugh, aren't you? A sport. How on earth could bridge ever be a sport? And they said, oh, well, it, it, it could be. I said, no, it can't. It's a bloody card game. I mean, you might as well have Happy Families and Snap or Monopoly, something like that, defined as a sport. And luckily, I don't think it's going to be happening any time soon. But, uh, but they've got that one in the paper. Oh, this is Lily Allen. So she goes out to, uh, to London Fashion Week, to a, a party or something, I don't know. And uh, she struck out at Grime Star Skepta. Who? Skepta? Who's that? Anyway, the smile... Drum and bass. Oh, right. Oh, the drum and bass, the stuff I like. Oh, right, it's one of my favourite tunes. I've got all the beat combo stuff. 
drum and bass, you know. <laughs> I, th- I think if I'm going to go busking later on today, drum and bass could be the thing I do out in Leicester Square. Steve Allen does drum and bass. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. I, seriously, I, I, I actually lost the plot when they started talking about garage and house and maisonette and apartment. And everything. I just I just didn't know what they were talking about. I said, I've got nothing. So I went out and I bought an Ibiza album and, and I put it under the car, thinking it would make me sound a little bit trendy. And uh, and it didn't at all because I didn't understand what they were doing, and so I've got this four four CD set Ibiza albums, and it's drum and bass, and it's crap, it's absolute garbage, and I put it on in the car. Do you know I couldn't get it out the machine fast enough, so I'm now back into the Disney classics when you wish upon a star, and under the sea, dun, 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 which is so much easier because I understand all the songs from The Little Mermaid and. Eh, you know, I love all that kind of stuff. I can do, I can do any of that, but I, I certainly couldn't do drum and bass. Contrary to what other people in this building might be telling you. So anyway, so Skepta uh, goes out there, and anyway, um, he he didn't acknowledge her. He was performing at this bash, and he'd failed to acknowledge Lily when she made her way into the roped-off VIP room. Lily's always been a huge fan of Skepta, and they became friends a years, years ago, and she wanted to say hello to him. Well, don't, dear, he's working. Stop showing off and going out there hoping to meet a drum and bass person. Come round here, I've got loads of drum and bass friends. I can introduce you to them. You won't understand the conversation, but you, uh, but you, might, you might enjoy it. Drum and bass. <laughs> Here's me, only the other night, Dolly Parton's greatest hits. I mean, how, how far away from drum and bass can that be? <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Angelina Jolie's going to adopt a Syrian orphan. No big surprise there. She seems to have adopted from every other country. She might... Oh, I like that. I like pictures on toast. That It's a Pope toaster. Have you seen this before? They make a toaster that when you, when you put the bread in, it toasts a picture of the Pope's face on it. I like that idea. Big into the Pope, me. Big into that. They love them in America. It's the souvenirs that are a wee bit tacky, but I like the idea of a Pope toaster. There should be a Steve Allen toaster, shouldn't there? Do you know that you could buy a thing years ago? I don't know if you ever saw it, and it was a little plastic... Uh, push thing with a picture on it and you pushed it into the bread and then you put the bread in the toaster and it just toasted the raised bits the other indentation bit and it was really clever i think you get one for me steve allen you know steve allen toast first thing well steve allen is toast i still think actually the drum and bass thing i'm sure that's got that's got legs that story excuse me mm. i think that's definitely got le- i think you could make that one run <laughs> not for too long. I got accused the other day of going to see a friend of mine and um, and, and sort of just to... Um, just sort of... God, these people turn up in my studio. I don't know where I'm going with this this morning. I really got no idea. And um, you should pop in and go and see uh, the team when you leave. They were disappointed, says Murray, when you didn't come in yesterday. I know. I can't do that. I mean, heavens above, I'm a radio presenter. <laughs> I can't just turn up in people's studios. He's turned up in my studio a few times. And that's all I shall say about it. Uh, Clive Bull for Taurus, part of the calendar. Imagine the nude photo, says Ian in Surbiton. Yeah, I quite fancy the idea of a nude calendar. I'd have to be liposuction the day before, just to make sure and sort of add hair and stuff like that. I <laughs> just drum and bass. <laughs> <laughs> Gary in Whitstable, thank you. Yes, I had heard. Actually, people seem to think that the, the studios here, I've got, within within five seconds of this studio, I've got... Two other studios, two other studios with people in, and I do go, I do go and visit other people's studios. It's just the sort of music that they're playing on some of these uh, these other ones that people think it's hilarious that somebody of my tender years uh, would be going to talk to. <laughs> Pat says I'd buy a Pope toaster or a Steve Allen one plus the Naked Calendar. I think the Naked Calendar's a winner. I've, I've advocated this some years ago, and said uh, you know that'd be good. How about a Skepta toaster? Says Peter. Yes, you could have Steve Allen one side, Skepta on the other. <laughs> Snakes and ladders, says Pablo, for the Olympics. That'll be good. This is after they were talking about bridge. Is it, an, is it a sport or is it a game? And you think, it, it's not a sport. They go, oh, but it's, it's a mind thing. And you go, it's a game of cards, for God's sake. I mean, you know, sk- uh, Skittles I could probably understand to a certain extent, but nothing, nothing that you play like Snap or Pontoon or Blackjack or Rummy or Gin Rummy or Bridge or any of these other things. I mean, they're, they're just, they're not sports. It's a card game. It's as simple as that. They're so stupid, these people. So, so stupid. Uh, two brothers hunted in the papers today. I'll tell you who they are. A little bit later on, suspected of throwing acid in the face of a mum of six... 
And uh, one woman said she used to watch eight hours of pornography every night. And she said it left me quite tired. Well, I should imagine it would. I should imagine it would. Anyway, she got fired from the job she had because she wasn't committed to, um, to the job. She was more addicted to watching porn, presumably, on the, uh, on the internet. I don't think it's arrived on the television. Oh, it has, actually. Of course it has, hasn't it? Babe Station. Have you ever seen that? Oh, dear. That's terrible. That's terrible. I mean, I didn't realise that there are people there in the early hours of the morning, saddos, I should imagine, who sort of, who dial up somebody they've never, ever heard of before. Uh, you know, they should call, call me. And you think, well, it's obviously not her you're going to be talking to, is it? Because she's actually working on the television, so it must be somebody else. Oh, and they've just done a 24-year study at Harvard University. Harvard University. And at the end of the 24 years, they've come up with the staggering thing that potatoes make you fat and broccoli's good for you. That's after 24 years. God knows if they'd had 25 years. They could have done all sorts of things, couldn't they, really? Guilt-ridden mum owns up to uh, leaving young children on their own. Uh, there's a woman in the paper today. Uh, well, in fact, there's quite a number of women, actually, in the papers. But this, this particular feature is on people who leave their kids alone in the car while they nip off. This is after uh, one member of S Club, Reach for the Stars, uh, went out and left the kids for, I think, about ten minutes while she nipped out. And uh, she said basically nothing. She's not uh, responded to the accusation. Um, but there's no law against it. There's no, you can do whatever you want. It's nothing to do with, with anybody, what you do with your children. That's your business until you do something terrible. So they've got one woman in the paper today, and she said she got told off by the police. I'd have sued. It's got nothing to do with the police, what you do with your children at all. You can leave them in the car. She said, I've left them before. The police phoned her at home and said, you know, you've been reported for leaving your children in the car. I'd have gone, mind your own business and put the phone down. It's got nothing to do with the police. There is no law on the statute books. There is nothing at all that says you can't leave your kids home alone or alone in the car. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Harvard. <laughs> My friend Jess, drum and bass. Uh, Harvard, yes, as opposed, as opposed to what? Harvard. I know. Harvard, Nagila, Harvard. <laughs> It's the best one I could think of. <laughs> Nothing else fitted into that. We were laughing the other day. They, they, uh, Jess had a, a newsreader on his programme who pronounced it Monarch. The Monarch is doing this. It made it sound like an airline, didn't it, really? Very, very funny. Harvard. Harvard University. I know. I'm just doing it to wind people up this morning. I quite like the idea of the, uh, of the, uh, of the toaster. The toasters, are, I'm going big time on that one. I think that's a winner. You could send in a picture of your loved one and they would then make the toaster plates inside so you could have a picture of yourself for, for breakfast every morning. What's the matter with that? I like the sound of that. Uh, return of the highway robbers. Yes, these are the robbers you don't want to encounter. These are people who deliberately crash into you and then demand money. You know, let's keep it out of the, uh, out of the insurance company. They want money. Uh, they're crooks. They're crooks. And they've done a big feature in one of the papers for today saying, um, you know, you've got to watch out for these people because they deliberately crash into people. They wouldn't be crashing into me any time soon. They really wouldn't. And uh, Brian says, I do hope in Prime Minister's question time today somebody from the opposition benches will say something like, doesn't the Prime Minister think he's made a pig's ear out of some of the current problems facing the country? Well, we've had all the jokes, haven't we? There's everything on the internet. Everything on the internet to do with uh, poor old Mr Cameron. And it comes down again. He says, I've been stabbed in the back by a little little thing, and um, they've also got that on the front page of the mail because they're serialising this book. I listened to the interview yesterday, which Nick Ferrari did with the co-author of the book. She didn't convince me at all of anything, pig's head or otherwise. I wasn't that interested, even on Loose Women. And Loose Women, generally speaking, you know, seem to have what... I mean, the, and the studio once applauded this when I think Janet Street Porter said, you know, I've read all the stuff and I think the only person who emerges as not being very pleasant is Lord Ashcroft. He said, nobody's particularly bothered about David Cameron and what he got up to as a, a teenager and uh, also in his much later life. Apparently when he went to prep school, they're now saying in the papers today, he didn't just go to prep school with sort of other children. Parents had, uh, at his prep school, were eight honourables, four sirs, two princesses, two marchionesses, one viscount, one earl, one lord and Her Majesty the Queen. So he was born with two silver spoons in his mouth. But he was a child. 
Nobody was to know that he was going to grow up and be the Prime Minister. Nobody had the faintest idea. So it's, it's slightly unfair to say that some of these debating societies at Oxford and Cambridge and probably rugby and Harrow and just about every other place in the entire country have these debating societies where there might or might not be initiation ceremonies and they might or might not stand up and drop their trousers or do something. I told you the other day of the famous person who said at their school... Um, they had a thing where all the freshers get into an ice-cold bath, naked, then they get out, then somebody takes a picture of them, start naked, makes it into a photo card, and they have to wear it round their neck all day. Now, can you imagine if that had been Dave Cameron or, you know, anybody who's in Cabinet at all? Anybody. They've all done something. And on Loose Women yesterday, they did say, come on, nobody can put their hands up and say that they, they went through childhood and they went through schooling without doing something without doing something. So they all agreed that, that nobody actually gives a forex what David Cameron did, because that was in the early days. You know, you know, did I ever sort of, you know, kick a cat? Obviously not. But, I mean, you know, did I ever sort of... I don't know, I can't think of anything that would be sort of something that would reflect badly on you later in life. I can't... Seriously, I can't think of anything. Did I tread on an ant? Yes, probably quite a number of ants, I should imagine, in the early days. And then it sort of comes back to haunt you. And especially in David Cameron's, because he's the Prime Minister. But I don't think Lord Ashcroft, who I'm a big fan of, don't get me wrong, I've said this every day, I don't think he's actually done himself any favours by doing this book, because it, it comes over as being a case of, I didn't get what I wanted, so I'm going to make you suffer. And I'm going to make you suffer in the worst possible way. I'm going to, you know, get stories repeated by people who don't like you, who are going to be telling things about you, about what you did with the pig's head, and what you did with this, and what happened here, and there were drugs. As, as Janet Street Porter said, oh, surprise, surprise! There were drugs at university. Why would there not have been drugs at university? There's drugs everywhere nowadays. You know, you could have come and watched Steve Allen doing drugs years and years ago. The only one in the school mainlining Hallib Orange. And if you mixed it with Coca-Cola, whoo! You could watch the Alsatian melting in the corner. It was fantastic. All sorts of things happened. So nobody bothered, and she said, I don't think anybody cares at all about this. And the audience burst into applause. So, quite clearly, she's, uh, she's right, and everybody else. Uh, what month and in what setting do you see good friend Christo in the calendar? I think, actually, Bill, probably as a staple... I don't actually see him as that. I don't, I mean, I don't think, unless we're doing double size calendar, I don't think we're actually going to fit him on one page. He'll have to be spread over two, won't he, at the very least? Well, his hair will be on one page and he'll actually be on the other. And you know what? Somebody will tell him that now. Somebody will go back to him and send him a thing saying, Oh, Steve Allen at 26 minutes past four in the morning was being rude about you. He knows I'm rude about him. He knows I'm rude about him. I'm rude about him all the time. I'm rude about everybody. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm actually so, so nice. Uh, Malcolm says, It's not often I have so much praise for a TV programme that I feel compelled to write about it. But the programme at 10.40 last night on ITV was called, And Here Is The News. Contributions from newsreaders past and present took us behind the scenes showing everything you need to know about the news and its reporters, warts and all. I know, we used to be in the ITN building. And... Uh, I could tell you all sorts of stories about behind the... It's not as exciting when you watch behind the news. Why would you want to know what was going on behind the news? You know, it's just somebody does a story, somebody will write it up, and it'll be put on auto queue, and somebody sits there, they do hair and makeup, and then they go on and talk about it. And that's, that's, that's the, the news. You can apparently now, says uh, Ian, uh, buy a feeder block for your goldfish that releases some of the food each day while you're away on holiday. I've used it. It's great. A feeder block. Never even heard of such a thing. Never even heard of such a thing. He says, they only turn up if there's a camera crew there. <laughs> Laugh out loud. They seem to, though, don't they? The RSPCA. There's a camera crew here. Oh, right, it'll be right over. It's like the Curry story. If this story had not made the newspapers, then uh, this bloke would still be whistling in the wind. We used to do a programme years ago with Jackie King, the consumer queen. And Jackie King would be an LBC. Uh, she worked with me, she worked with Clive Bull, she worked with loads of people. And she was excellent at sorting out your disagreements with shops. And the one phrase, if I learnt nothing else from Jackie King, was, it's not of merchantable quality. Not of merchantable quality. And what that basically means is, if you buy a pair of Wellington boots and they let the water in, you want either your money back or replacement because they're not of merchantable quality. If you buy an umbrella that you get soaking wet under, it's not of merchantable quality. And not of merchantable quality means that it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. An umbrella is supposed to keep you dry. Wellington's supposed to keep the water out. It can be all sorts of things. A fridge that doesn't work, because it doesn't keep stuff cool, is not of merchantable quality. 
and uh, there were all sorts of tricks, but she said the one thing that you never got back, she said, was any feedback from places like Curry's. The high street electrical retailers really weren't very good at responding to people at all. It's, they, they were the ones who'd say, you need to take out an extended warranty, you know, and if you've got a grievance, you need to go back to the manufacturer, and the answer is, of course, no, you don't. You go back to where you bought it from. So, in other words, if I've got a problem with something I bought from Curry's and it goes wrong, I go back to Curry's. And if they try and fob you off, then you stand your ground. If necessary, take them to court. Because it's all too easy for them to take your money and not give you the service as a backup. And I think service is paramount. Absolute paramount. Apart from that, their interest rates are absolutely astonishingly awful. So, uh, I think, you know, and also, there's a warranty in the box with everything you ever buy. You don't need to buy extended warranties. You really don't. Take my advice. Don't do it. The woman who's suing bosses for breaking wind by her desk. I don't know. I mean, you some, she wants £400,000, apparently. That's what it's worth nowadays. <laughs> when you think over the years, I've been able to inflate probably quite a number of uh, balloons. But, uh, you know, you sort of... Uh, £400,000. Do you know, some people just live in court, don't they? Some people just live for the compensation. Some pe- You know, you can't say that to me. Uh, why not? Well, I want money. I want, apparently, as if money cured everything. I don't think money does nowadays. Saying sorry appears not to solve the problems, does it? People go, no, well, I'm terribly sorry I said that about you. Well, I want money. Well, I've said sorry. Well, I want money. Well, how does that make it better? It doesn't, but I want the money. And that's what it comes down to. You know, whiplash claims and all that kind of baloney, which we know the majority of them, 90%, I think, are fraudulent. And people people just come up with anything else. Stress is another fairly good one, isn't it? People come up with stress nowadays. They go, I can't do that. I'm stressed. I was talking the other day to a friend of mine who's a radio presenter, and his uh, producer said to him, uh, what happens if you go sick? He said, I don't go sick, (laughs) which I thought actually kind of summed up my life. I don't go sick. Because if you're a freelance presenter, don't work, don't get paid. So I think everybody should be freelance. That way you'd have less company sickness, you'd have more loyalty to the company, people would be better off. And then, you know, because if you're a staff person in a job, you wake up in the morning, you go, achoo, that's it, I'm off work today, I've got a cold. I'm sorry, I can't come in today, I don't feel very well. And they go, all right, are you sure uh, I don't want to to infect people? I couldn't care less. I did did know a presenter once, I still know a presenter, and he couldn't bear anybody to be around him if they had a cold. He said, out, out the studio. I work for a living. He said, I don't want to uh, become ill by things like that. And I've still yet to have, he says, banging the top of his arm, my flu jab. And why do they call it a jab? Why don't we just not use the word injection? It's an injection. So always the biggest needle going. Isn't it? For the flu jab. You look at it and you think, oh, God, that's going into my arm. In fact, actually even thinking about it now makes, makes me go somewhat queasy. Because I'm not very good with injections. I'm all right doing myself. I, I can inject myself every day. That's fine. Because the needles are not very big. But when they, when they do the flu jab on it, I look at it and, I, you know, a little lump comes into your throat. You start feeling that sort of welling up in your stomach like, I'm going to be sick. I don't like I try and look at the ceiling. I try and look at the scene and they go, there, 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 and they sort of, they rub it, you go, ooh, it hurts. You can understand why, why babies cry. I've seen them on the television when they're inoculating in other countries, and the baby will be there, oh, look, here's a nice, kindly person coming to, what the bloody hell's that? And then all of a sudden you get delayed reaction. They sort of go, da, 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 and it hurts. Same with injections. I know some people do it really brilliantly. I used to know some ladies in pathology which is where I used to go to get my diabetes checked out. And they could get a needle into your arm without you even knowing that the needle was in there. They were that good. It was that good. Sometimes, it, in fact, one of the nurses who, who does my injections now, when I have to go in for flu jabs, she admits that she doesn't like injections herself. And it's a fear, isn't it? There are certain things we have fears of in this world. Mine is... Actually, I don't have a fear of injections. I just don't... I don't particularly like them. We don't like the dentist. Because you can't see what they're doing. They could, they could be etching their name on your teeth. You've got no idea. They could they could be writing on the back of your tooth, I really hate this person. You know, because you've got no idea, have you? And before you go into the dentist and you, and you go, all right, I'll, I'll book in for next Thursday. And so you book in for Thursday and you go and sit there and you can hear the other person in there screaming the place down. And all you can hear is this, woo, woo, woo. So it makes my teeth go funny just doing that. And, uh, and we hate it. We hate the dentist. I don't like snakes either. Not too big on lions and tigers. <laughs> but as long as I'm not in the cage with them, I'm all right. I always think of that, that poor lad some years ago who was on a school trip, wasn't he, in Africa, and they were camping out under the stars, like you do, and they had a campfire and everything else, and that was supposed to keep them away, but a lioness came a-hunting for food. And it isn't until you see lionesses when they're up close. You look at the size of them. Look at the size of their paws. 
if they can cling on to the back of water buffalo, bringing down an adult isn't exactly much uh, much of a challenge for them. And this lioness poked its head in the tent, and they, they, it's like Lion King come to life. And he made the big mistake of running. Whereas if he just sat there, it probably wouldn't have done anything. But, I mean, you kind of don't want to risk it, do you? So he ran. And that then meant, unfortunately, he, he became prey. And that must have been absolutely... I hate things like that. Drowning frightens me. Drowning frightens me. I, 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 I don't mind, you know, jumping into a bath and into a shower and things like that. But I've got this dread fear of water. I'm just, Drowning's euphoric. Yeah, well, let me know when you do it then. Come back and tell us about it. Drowning's euphoric. No, no, what it is is, no, try telling the people on the Titanic that drowning's euphoric. Yeah, you're going to have a great time bobbing around, bobbing around on the beautiful briny sea, straight to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> you should imagine. <laughs> you imagine. But the, the reason is that they, they say that when you, when you drown, you're, you're right, there is something about it that you get to the stage where you cannot hold your breath anymore. And you take a breath, and that's when the water fills your lungs, and that's when you sort of... That's when things go slightly pear-shaped. But they say, oh, it's OK. Well, I wouldn't fancy it. I wouldn't fancy it. Even when I was on an ocean liner, we went on one of these cruise ships. I don't want to put you off or anything like that. But in the middle of the ocean, you suddenly realise how big the ocean is and how piddling you are. You're a little tiny... Seriously, you'd never see anybody because it's all waves. Little waves, and sometimes big waves. And there was a thing on the television, you know, one of those It'll Be All Right on the Night, the Dennis Norton-type programmes. And um, and there was a couple in the cabin. All of a sudden, the, the porthole swung open, and all this water poured in. Well, that would just frighten the life out of me. So, in fact, I, f I get frightened about most things when I think about it. Aircraft, not particularly good. Always sit at the back of an aircraft. They never reverse into mountains. They always go straight in. So I think if I'm sitting at the back, I might stand a better chance and also nearer the toilets. I don't like to have to stand there. There's nothing worse, is there? Even though you're sitting near the toilets, there's always a queue of people standing next to you. You're trying to eat your sandwich and have a little bit of pasta. And there's people standing next to you. And you think, I know where you go. You're going to the toilet. There's nothing private about going to the toilet on an aircraft, is there? Till you get in there and discover the person in front of you has had a little bit of an accident. Uh, what else was there? Oh, there's a woman bre <laughs> breastfeeding. <laughs> In a car, in a car park, strangely, and she gets a parking ticket. In a car park, I tell you what the thing annoys me is. I like, I, I, I hate people who park in car parks in the disabled spaces. And you know damn well there were two women who got out of a car, Sainsbury's at Hampton the other day. Let's just call them Chav, shall we? Being polite, and they had a disabled sticker. Well, they were wearing tracksuit bottoms. They nearly ran into the supermarket. I thought the whole idea of a disabled sticker was the fact you can't walk, so I suspect it was probably their mothers and they were using it fraudulently because that's what a lot of people do. They use them fraudulently. Uh, Victoria Beckham got drunk again. She seems to be doing that quite a bit, but because she doesn't eat, the drink goes uh, straight to her and uh, 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 staggers out. She was at her own party at her little boutique and uh, Davy Boy turned up. And obviously, she went, I own a home, David. And so he, he, he puts on his butch face and tries to look concerned. But in fact, he just looked like Mr Grumpy. And she just looks like Miss, Miss I've had a few sherbets. <laughs> Which, of course, is very funny because she came out at night time wearing dark glasses. I mean, nobody wears dark glasses at night. Her sight is going to be so bad. I mean, my eyesight is not the most brilliant in the world. But uh, at, at least I can always find somewhere, you know, when I've had a couple of drinks just about. I have had the situation where my jeans have ceremoniously dropped to the ground as I've been carried back. But I mean, it was only the once. They only made the mistake once. But I did go to Joe Allen's yesterday because my brother was up and he was doing... Oh, I can't remember what he was doing now. He went to the Royal Albert Hall and... You know, I come. At, he told me what it was. It was something. It was something that he'd really wanted to see. So him and his girlfriend were up there and I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll meet you in Joe Allen's. I'll buy you lunch. And then... Uh, then you can go on. He was meeting a, a friend of his, uh, Peter, and his wife, Jan, and then they were going to go off to the Royal Albert Hall. So anyway, uh, but I'd, they didn't get there till quite late, and I'd had to text them, David Gilmore, that's right. It's David Gilmore Pink Floyd, isn't he? Well, he was doing it. My brother wanted to see this show and managed to get online. He got through and he got really, really good seats because he said something, and I forget what it was. I think he'd, he'd come online... And he just thought he was buying normal tickets. And the woman said, oh, are you looking for the so and whatever they were, the so-and-so tickets? And he went, yes, not knowing what it was. And he found himself in really super tickets. So he was very pleased. So he went to that. But, of course, I yesterday had had the Bay, uh, the Bay City Rollers. I'm now obsessed with the Bay City Rollers. I'd had the Osmonds in yesterday. Jimmy, Merrill, and Jay came in yesterday. And as I predicted, and every time that I've ever done them, they are just professional. They're Americans... They've done 
so many interviews in their life. I wouldn't like to imagine how many interviews they must have done. And it was lovely to see them. They've got a show coming up uh, around Christmas time, and it's the Andy Williams show. So they're going to be singing the songs that uh, they used to sing on Andy Williams' show when he was alive and on the television. And they, they, they've done it with him before. And so they've got Jimmy Cricket on. They've got uh, some singing. It's going to be a real... It's, it's a Christmas show for the family. OK? A Christmas family show. So all the fans of the Osmonds and their children will be going to see the show at Christmas. And so, but they arrived in a little bit late. And you can't rush through an interview with people. I don't like to rush through interviews. It makes, makes it look a bit rude. So we were sort of chatting away, and then I had another interview downstairs in another studio. So I rush up, st- well, I say rush, I tend to walk fairly slowly. And, and I, so I did the Osmonds, and I said, listen, thank you. And my friend Tony was then interviewing them. So they had a, a lot of interviews, and I then nipped downstairs to do Bill Bailey, who had also just finished doing an interview with some other friends of mine in the business. And so all in all, it was quite nice. Then I went to chat to my friend Chris, and uh, we didn't get the cup of coffee I was promised the other day, but I got to sit in on a show meeting. I haven't done a show meeting before. Won't ever do one again. It's, uh, it's where people sit down after they've done a radio programme and they analyse what they've done. Now, I've, I've never done things like this before because I, I'm not really the sort of person who, uh, who wants to analyse what I've done after I've actually done it. As far as I'm concerned, it's a radio programme. Different if you're doing certain sorts of radio programmes where you have to go, right, we did that competition, did that work properly? If we do that again, we'll do it differently and we've got this coming up and that coming up. Well, I never know, even, you know, when the red light goes on in the morning on this programme, what the heck I'm going to be talking about. I've got no idea. It isn't till the red light comes on and I've sat there for about 30 seconds in my mind, it's like an hour, and planning it out, and then it just, it just evolves. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason, there's no sort of running order on this programme apart from a set of newspapers and, uh, and a piece of paper with uh, some of the topics that uh, I might or might not be doing in the morning. But they sat down, they had this meeting for an hour, and I was invited in. God, it was dull. God, it was dull. I mean, really. There was no tea or biscuits, and I could have done with a bourbon or something like that, just a sort of a dunking biscuit, because I couldn't contribute because it wasn't my programme. And frankly, I wouldn't have been interested anyway. And they were talking about, we've got to do this, and then, you know... I mean, I heard so many bits of gossip that I could impart onto this programme that I thought, you know, I could fill an hour easy with what they've done. But I thought, no, do not do, not do it. That is betraying a confidence, you know. Somebody's a friend... You never sell a friend down the river. So anyway, I'll tell you a little bit later on exactly what happened in the meeting. <laughs> I could tell you all the guests coming up and everything. I could tell you who's actually doing a live gig. I could, t- I could tell you everything. But um, no, I wouldn't do it. I would. <laughs> I, was like, I hate it in the office. Somebody says to me, I'm going to tell you something. You're not to tell anybody. Well, you might as well put it on the front page of The Sun. Don't ever tell me something if you don't want it to go any further. I know that seems really awful, but I'm, I can't help it. Sometimes inadvertently you just open your mouth and... and out it comes. And I blurted things out and people said, what have you said that for? I'd gone, was I not supposed to say anything? They went, no, I told you in confidence. I go, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, but don't tell me anything in confidence. The worst thing you can ever say is, I'm going to tell you this, but don't tell anybody. Because I can't help it. There's a burning thing. I can't wait to tell people things. And I found myself chipping in at this, this programme meeting the other day with nothing at all to do with the programme meeting. But it was just that I felt I'd sat there for five minutes and I hadn't contributed and as you know me, I don't want to sit there being quiet because I'm a radio presenter, so I have to chip in. I mean, it was totally pointless stuff I was doing, but it made me laugh. So, there you go. I told them I'd managed to fill at least four or five minutes by talking about the meeting that never existed, apart from in their minds. I don't care about any revelation. I really don't. I really don't. Every, every poll that I've read, everybody said the same thing. Listen, does it really matter what somebody did 30 years ago when they were at university? So there might have been initiation ceremonies. So they might have dropped their trousers. You know, go to a rugby match. You'll find hundreds of people doing it. Every single rugby game. It never changes. It never ch- it, Nobody makes a big deal about things like that. And yet, if it's the Prime Minister... And they've all done something, haven't they? Obama, everybody. Everybody's got something in their life. So this book... Because you now realise, and I didn't realise either, that um, that Lord Ashcroft is uh, majority owner in the publishing house that produces this book. So the profits are going to, I think, 
army or forces charities, which is great. I mean, I don't have any problem with anything he does there. But there's always been questions about, you know, has he paid tax on this? Has he not paid tax on that? And then the other day they were saying, don't ever cross him. And what he did, he gave money... I think he gave five million to the Imperial War Museum, which I said the other day, and he's got this room with all the VCs in because he's rich enough to buy them, and he puts them on display. I mean, you'd never get them insured at home, so you put them in a museum where they're covered by insurance, and it's much, much safer. You very rarely get people breaking into museums. But it's just that the whole thing is a case of he didn't got, get what he wanted from Cameron, so he writes a book saying, oh, this is what he got up to. and this. But, you know, I'm sure that even Lord Ashcroft himself must have got up to things. I mean, nobody's gone through life without doing stuff, have they? So, day four, you begin to wonder how many more blasted days we're going to have to suffer with this. Um, the Syrian refugees, David Cameron's £115 million pounds to stem the flow of Syrian refugees, if indeed they are from Syria. That was the big question, wasn't it? Uh, is it enough, or have we already given too much? We hear from the doctor, who's helped a wheelchair-bound man walk, and should you be able to sue a colleague if they pass wind beside you? I mean, to be honest with them, to be brutally honest, you just go, oh, go away. Go away, please. That's Nick and the team. Uh, after the morning news with Lisa Aziz, James Ashton, executive editor at the Evening Standard, will be looking at the papers for this morning. Tracy says, uh, I'm listening from sunny Perth in Australia. She says, we emigrated six years ago, and I was telling the kids about your show the other day, remembering all the old adverts. Dinner was very lively that night, and we all began singing Finger of Fudge, and if you like a lot of chocolate on your biscuit, join our club. It's amazing the adverts that you remember, isn't it, and how many are still going. We managed to get a good good two and a half hours out of that on the programme the other day, which always surprises me, because some, you know, I mean, the, the majority of programmes just truck through in their merry little way as I annihilate the stories in the papers and uh, tell you my thoughts on, on some of the people who feature within the pages of the papers. Then we have a free podcast as well, which is a, a celebrity fest. It's, you know, it's where you sort of look at people and you go, why are these people famous? They can't do anything. Just being on a reality show is, is not enough for me. I'm looking for somebody who's got a talent, somebody who can juggle, be a ventriloquist, do magic, do something. Not just sort of, you know, turn up, you know, push your boobs out in front of you. I mean, that's just old tarts land, isn't it? Hence, you know, you've got Made in Chelsea. Hence, you've got Towie. And to a certain extent, you've got the Housewife programmes. The best one we've got, which is rubbish, is Cheshire. What a bunch of old mingers on that programme. I mean, seriously... You know, they're not, they're nowhere near class. These people don't have any class at all. They're just people who've got money, and money, money does not buy you class, as Gemma Collins has proved. Just buys you a big bum, I think. Um, so, nice to have you with us uh, this morning, Tracy. And uh, one here, suing for breaking wind. Yes, I mean, of course, what would be interesting is if the person who was breaking wind had some, you know, like IBS, Crohn, celiac, and then can sue back for disability discrimination. She wants £400,000. Although, strangely, in this particular case, the, uh, the person concerned um, is already off work with stress. Stress. I mean, God, I mean, these people have got no idea what stress is. What's stress because somebody breaks wind near you? They might be ill. You don't know. You really don't... I don't believe somebody stood by their desk and deliberately broke wind, but as I wasn't there, I don't really know. But I just... You worry about that kind of thing, don't you? And um, I gather you like uh, Tommy Bahama shirts, says Anne. I noticed a fake market, in a fake market locally, they have these short sleeves, very bright colours, silk. No, these are not silk. They're definitely not silk. Um, so I... Uh, uh, no, I, I wouldn't buy anything like that at all, actually. I really wouldn't. I, I, silk I don't buy. It's, it's very nice, and it looks great on certain people. Not on me. I think you can sweat through silk, can't you? I, I can believe you sweat through it. And uh, certainly the week for emission stories, says Ian. It is, isn't it? We've, we've had everything. We've had everything this week. I don't think there's anything that we've not touched on the programme. So we'll try to leave it alone a little bit uh, later on. Yes, you're absolutely right. No biscuits. No biscuits. I didn't see the live episode of Corrie. I'm told the fake blood was almost laughable. But I go with what I said the other day, uh, which is, what do they bother doing a live thing for? Unless it was for just for publicity purposes. And that's exactly what it was for. It was so they could, you know, say, oh, look, it, it gets some attention to a programme. And when you get some attention to a programme, you get coverage in the papers. And the coverage in the papers can transform itself into audience. There might be people who decided to watch Corrie for the first time because it was live, waiting for what I said the other day would be a disaster because somebody at some point would forget their lines. 
And uh, that's what we're waiting for. They did it in EastEnders, you know, all very confident. And then all of a sudden they get, because they're, they're so used to being able to go, come and do that bit again. They go, OK, quickly, let's do it again. So, Rita, do you want a cup of tea? And that's how it goes. And they just edit all in. If you're doing live, it's a bit more difficult. And they don't like doing live, which means that 90% of the people in soaps could never appear on stage because they just couldn't manage it. You get stage actors, television actors and film actors. They're all completely different. They're all actors, collectively. They're all doing the same thing, but some of them can do it and some of them can't do it. And I suspect that those on Corrie have spent most of their life there and they couldn't do theatre work. They wouldn't know about doing theatre work and how to project and send your voice to the back of the theatre because you don't have microphones on or somebody with a boom mic over your head. Uh, Former Sex Pistol, John uh, Lydon. Uh, he's bitter over the BBC ban for trying to name and shame Jimmy Savile. Good God, John Lydon's still around, is he? What an old fraud. What an old fraud, yeah. I am an anti I am a... Oh, dear. Sex pistols. One of them dead. The other two disappeared completely. And John Lydon reduced to advertising butter and doing I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. That's how desperately sad. That's how, that's how you know, I am a punk rocker kind of materialised for him. And then... And he said... What was it he said something about... He said when he was a baby, his mum put a nappy on him and put the pin through his willy. He said, and the pain was excruciating. I thought, you don't remember when you were a baby. Don't lie about things. You've lied about most things. Why would you want to lie about something as stupid as that? But uh, they put him on. They must be running out of guests, actually. They really must have run out of guests at all. Or they're relying now on agents coming up and saying to to old uh, Piers Drogan's people, you know, would you fancy having Johnny Rotten on? He's, he's uh, done loads of things, you know. Yeah, most of it's just been a bit fraudulent, though, hasn't it? It's, you know, he's, he sort of, he lives in a very well-to-do place. He's got, you know, the money. The Sex Pistols, I was around when they were at their, their zenith. And I thought they were rubbish then. Jane says, I can't even bear the ads for the wives of Cheshire. They're just, they're rubbish, aren't they? They're absolute rubbish. They're just, they're just naff old show-offs. The Americans are so much better the Americans do it better because they don't understand irony. Over here, you get any old Tom, Dick and Harry that turns up in Housewives of Cheshire. I mean, some of them, I don't know what, how much money you have to have to be on the programme, but they're just a bit, they're just naff. I couldn't get off on the programme at all. I'm, and I, you know I adore the ones in America, the Housewives of Orange County we started with, and then it's just built and built and built. And I think they're brilliant because every programme throws up some nasty people. But because they're American... I, I give them a little bit more rope to hang themselves, and I and I do like it. I do like it. But the Housewives of Cheshire, I watched two, and I thought, oh, God, what a naff existence. I mean, some of the houses are really naff. They're not even classy. There's nobody living in big mansions. There's nobody living in big... Ma- and I would, that's what I was expecting. I was expecting people living in big mansions and showing us, you know, what it was like to live the high life. That's the whole idea about it. They're not supposed to be, you know, sort of some naff woman who goes to a car boot or, or who goes to a... Um, a salon to have their nails done. I mean, that's not of any interest to anybody. That's why Jordan's programme was axed. Both Jordan and Peter Andre's programmes were axed because they didn't do anything. Pete just went out with some set-up uh, bits of filming so Pete could meet the fans, because he, me- he loves his kids, and he wanted to meet the fans. And Jordan just spent most of her time sitting in her tracky bottoms, because she's chav, in front of the television or on the computer. That was it. She didn't do anything. There was nothing going on in her life. I remember at one time she was in some studio having a having yet another dreary picture taken where they try and make her look, I don't know, like some grotesque drag queen. And uh, she, she said to the camera, she said, oh, are the, are the paparazzi here? It was stalking me. So we looked out the window, there was nobody. There was nobody there at all. There was no paparazzi. She poo-pooed the idea the other day, didn't she, that she was going to be recording with Kavanagh. Kavanagh, who thinks that she's his best friend. Well, you should know by now that Katie Price has no friends, mainly because she disses all of them and because she's just so deeply unpleasant and quite lonely. 